Welcome to another edition of Soundstage, brought to you by the Bruce Springsteen Archives and Center for American Music on the campus of Monmouth University. I'm your host, Bob Santelli. Today's guest is Stevie Van Zandt, E Street Band guitarist, who's released a brand new live album with his other band, The Disciples of Soul. Recorded in 2019 at New York City's Beacon Theater, Summer of Sorcery Live is jam-packed with rock and soul music. Two discs plus a bonus disc. They sent you the record, I hope? Yeah, yeah, I heard it. Wavy <laughs> gravy, where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm always going to give you a surprise, right? Yeah, that was. <laughs> and he did a good job, actually. He did a good job. My I lifelong ambition. All right, Stevie, so you have a new live album coming out in July, um, and it is an album that was recorded at the Beacon Theater, a great place to record a live album, I think. What's the, um, what's the origins of the idea of releasing a live album? Why release a live album? Well, um, you know, I, I'm, not a, I'm not the biggest fan of live albums, actually. Um, you know, I'm always like, I'd rather hear the, I'd rather hear the album, you know, the, uh, the, the studio versions of most things. But um, um, so, some of the arrangements were significantly changed. So that kind of justifies it in my mind. Um, I'm, I'm playing songs uh, in the show that originally didn't have horns, you know, adding horns to something like a camouflage of righteousness, for instance, um, you know. Um, and, um, you know, I, when I do a show, uh, it's really, it's the same show every night. It's, it's like a Broadway show. You know, every song has a purpose. There's a story being told. And, um, and so it, it kind of works as a separate artistic entity from the album, even though the album itself is a, is a concept. Um, the show is actually a bit more linear in a way, in a funny way, even though I'm, I'm throwing in songs from other albums and from the past and, and you know, uh, whatever. Um, it actually tells a, a, a bigger story so that I, I look at the, I look at albums like a, uh, like the basic script, you know, but then when you get to the set, you know, you, you expand the film, you know, to include other things, you know, um, and, and that's so, so uh, it really is its own artistic, it, it is, you know, le legitimate artistic, you know, enterprise among, you know, it, itself. And my dog's gonna start barking here in a minute. Let's see. Yeah, she was barking. Uh, she has something to say about it, I think. Is the decision made to record the album live at the Beacon Theater beforehand, or did you listen to the uh, tapes and you said, wow, it was a great show, I should do this one? No, no, we, uh, we actually record every show. I mean, the, the, the Soul Fire uh, live uh, show uh, was from like, uh, you know, I don't know how many, seven or eight different cities. Um, you know, and it's a little bit more painstaking, you know, it's a bit more uh, finding the perfect solos or, you know, the perfect performance of a song. <laughs> Uh, she's only going to bark for another minute or so, and then I'm only going to give her some carrots. Uh, so, um, um, but but in, in this case, um, you know, we get to the end of the tour, and it was a lot of emotion uh, that night because it was the end of a th a, you know, three years of um, it was the end of three years of, of touring. You know, we really went from Soul Fire right into some of sorcery, so. Um, it was the end, you know, and, and we knew it was going to be a while, and and maybe, you know, it might have been the last the, la the last tour ever. Uh, who knows? So so you know, it was a lot of emotion, and I think it it really um, came through uh, in in the show. So we said, you know what, that show just felt great. Uh, let's let's just you know not bother going through you know the other you know forty shows whatever it was, um, and we just decided let's just go with that. You said something interesting there. It might be the last tour ever. Now, what do you mean by that? Meaning that could be the end of the Disciples of Soul or what? Yeah, well, you never know. I mean, it was, it was, the whole thing was, was not planned. You know, the entire, you know, um, coming back into the business was not planned. You know, I didn't plan on coming back into the music business or making any more records really. Um, so that whole thing was an accident. 
uh, that started in 2016 when uh, this promoter in England just said, you know, throw a band together and play my blues festival, you know. And I was like, wow, I haven't fronted a band in, you know, 30 years, but, uh, you know, it sounded like fun. And one thing led to another. The band was so good. My Mark Ribbler put, put the band together for me. Uh, he was the uh, MD, you know, the, the music director I had chosen for Darlene Love. So I borrowed him back from Darlene and he threw the band together. And I had a couple of old friends, you know, like Eddie uh, Mannion and Stan Harrison. Um, uh, Clark uh, Clark had done a couple of E Street tours, but uh, mostly it was new 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 people, and and um, the band just sounded so good that we decided to do a you know, and this is just when when Bruce started his Broadway uh, run, and I didn't have a new TV show. I was trying to get, I was trying to sell a script. I had five new scripts, you know, and and they were going round and round, and we had a close call here, a close call there, a couple of other offers for TV shows, but nothing was coming through. I was like, man, got to do something. So, well, uh, you know, why don't we do a record of songs I've written for other people, you know, just for fun, uh, you know, no big, no sweat. And so that was Soul Fire. By some accident, uh, uh, this guy who was a big fan decided to sponsor a tour. So we're touring with Soul Fire. And then um, slowly uh, this new idea started coming to me, you know, and so Summer of Sorcery was just a complete gift that I didn't, I didn't plan on at all. And, um, and you know, and, and so um, I, I, it, it really felt like closure uh, in a funny way for me, uh, just reconnecting with my own work, which I had abandoned for 30 years, which enabled me to actually write the book during this pandemic, because I, I tried writing it 10, 15 years ago, and I just didn't feel like I had an ending at all, you know? And now, and now it kind of this this provided that little bit of a little bit of closure for that part of my life, anyway. So who knows? But it was extremely expensive, extremely difficult to get it on the road, um, and it may not ever happen again. You know, I mean, let's face it. Uh, you know, if Bruce goes out next year, you know, that's two years gone. I do want to get back on TV. You know, so. Uh, you never know. You never know. So, you know, I, I mean, we play every show like it's our last show anyway, you know, whether it's uh, E Street Band or whether it's Disciples of Soul, you know, uh, that's just the way we are. You know, we we, we give 100% no matter what. But, um, but you know, there was that emotion because we were like a family for three years. It was a new family. And now we're going to part and, you know, we're going to get back together in a couple of years, maybe, maybe, but uh it's going to require a patron of the arts <laughs> to, to say, you know, you guys do good work. You know, here's a couple of million dollars. Go, go, go out and have some fun. You know, you, you mentioned uh, the book uh, and I wanted to ask you that. I do want to talk about the album, of course, but very quickly, the book. So finally, your memoirs are finished. Give us a little sense of what that in entails and when it might be coming out. It's coming out September 28th and end of September. Um, it's um, it, it's you know it's 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 my story, but um, it's a little bit more than that. I, I certainly hope um, you know. I'm trying to. I wanted it to be like a you know a real page turner. I wanted it to be like a detective novel as as this guy goes through life, trying to find his identity, you know, and, and find out who he is. Um, I think it's something that everybody can relate to. You don't have to be a musician to relate to it. I, I don't think. So it has that kind of, you know, a little bit of that, you know, Dan Brown, you know, surprising, you know, kind of, you know, a surprise around every corner thing to some extent, you know. Um, the other style really is, I, the closest I would compare it to is just a real straight ahead, you know, um, not that I can compare myself to him, but that, that sort of uh, Hemingway style uh, of just a straight ahead kind of, uh, you know, conversational, you know, style, uh, which is that's just me, you know, and 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 then um, the other thing I tried to do was occasionally, you know, pass along some insights or or a bit of um, you know uh, knowledge about a craft or two, you know, because there's a number of crafts in there uh, mentioned, you know, so it's like you know. My favorite, uh, my favorite author is uh, Nikos Kazantzakis, and uh, when I read Kazantzakis, you, you know, I, 
you could read the you could read the story, you know, you can read the narrative, you know, like a regular book if you want to. Or, you know, on every page, he has something that makes you think, you know. And it takes me months to read a book by him. Because I every single page, I'm like, you know, I, whoa, 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 I gotta think about that, you know, for a minute, you know. Uh, so I, I want a little bit of that in there too. You know, you, you know, you can you can read it quickly because you know the story is the story. But uh, there's more, you know, there's more going on, you know, and I, I try to I try to throw some some of those things in there. So, um, you know, it, it's it's uh, I, I think it's I think it I think it turned out pretty pretty good, you know. Yeah. Um, What's it called, Steve? Unrequited infatuations. Nice, nice. Well, we'll look for that, and hopefully, uh, we'll bring you back on to uh, to talk about that as a as the pub day gets closer. But in the meantime, again, back to the album. It's a double album with bonus tracks. There's a lot of music on it. Uh, and there's also a number of guests. And I was taken after listening to the album, I put on the CD, and all of a sudden, who pops up? Wavy Gravy, the ultimate hippie. Now, how did he get the opportunity to introduce you at, at Beacon Theater? Was that something where he was in town and you just said, come on, or, or was it pre-planned? Um, you know, I, I kind of established a... <laughs> A, a high standard on on, on Soul Fire, you know. I, I had Mike Stoller introduce that show, you know, and that's uh, that's a pretty tough one to beat, you know. Uh, uh, for those of those who don't know, uh, Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller were my my mentors and my heroes, and the first real uh, songwriter producers in rock and roll of of real note, you know, and they really established the whole the entire. Uh, template for, for everything I do and, and a lot of other people. Anyway, so so Mike introduced us uh, in LA uh, uh, on the Soul Fire tour. Uh, Wavy Gravy is just one of them guys, it's just one of them, another one of my heroes. Uh, he happened to be a friend of Bananas, <laughs> which, you know, makes sense. <laughs> uh, I mean, Banana, Banana being in the band, first of all, let me just say, has been one of the thrills of my life. Um, that he has been my piano player for the last three years. Uh, you know, I met him at, at you know, uh, I'm associated with a, with a blues festival um, in, in Norway called Newtoden. It's a very, very, uh, very highly regarded blues festival in the middle of nowhere. And they have, they've had everybody there. It's like 30, 30 years now. Um, and I met Banana, I met Banana at, at, at Newtoden uh, Blues Festival and, uh, just before we started, you know, and I, and I just said, you know, what are you doing next year? He said, eh, I got some things booked. I said, you know, you want to be on my piano player? He's like, yeah, sure. You know, <laughs> and uh, what a thrill, what a thrill. Cause you know, the Young Bloods, uh, that first Young Bloods album for me, one of the top 10 greatest albums of all time, uh, you know. Uh, anyway, um, so he's a friend, he was a friend of, of Bananas. I, I don't remember. I guess he was in town. If if we um, if uh, if in fact uh, I'm not even sure if if he was if he was at the Beacon or not. Uh, I think I think maybe he was. He was. He, he announced the show, so he had to be there. I would imagine. Well, you know, but sometimes you can you know you can have, <laughs> have a, an MC from a different show. But yeah, no, I, I I don't know why he was there. I I, I don't I don't think we flew him in. Although I would have I would have I would have been happy yeah. to. Um, so I guess I guess he just, maybe he just happened to be in town, and uh, banana. Like I said, you know, banana. I said banana. Call wavy gravy. See if it comes down. <laughs> well, there are other um, guests on on the album as well, and of course, uh, you do a couple of really interesting versions of songs that are not yours, like Freeze Frame, and with Peter Wolf is there, and and of course you have Nils Lovgren on the album. Um, you know, those kind of things when you have special guests, not only they are exciting for the people in the audience or people listening to the record, but it also got to be exciting for people on stage as well. Yeah, it, it's always a little fun. You know, I, I don't have a whole lot of room in, in my, in this show in particular, um, you know, uh, you, you got to save them for the end for encores or something, you know, after the show itself is done because you can't really break up the show the way I have it, the way I have it planned. So um, it's not like guests can come and go in the middle of a show. So they, they, you know, they'll either come and join me on Sun City, which is, you know, had a multiple artist thing anyway. 
um, or um, you know, in Nils's case, um, he has that great song, and we and we had a lot of fun with that. You know, I put put the horns on that, and um, it's a terrific uh, version of it, isn't it? I mean, it really oh, yeah. cooks. And uh, and then um, you know, Jimmy Barnes joined us in Australia. I had written "Ride the Night Away" for him. And uh, so he joined us for, for that, for, you know, what he had a hit with in, in Australia. Uh, Peter Garrett, of course, was on Sun City. Uh, he joined us. Um, some, young, some young artists coming up, you know, and uh, I forget who else is on the record, but, but you, know, it, you know, they, they, they kind of come, come at the end, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have, make room for them, you know, for Sun City or, or something like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, not, we don't we don't do too many, but but if somebody comes by, you know, and they want anyone to get on stage, it's it's fun. It's fun for the band. Yeah, you know, listening to the album, I'm always struck by how um, how consistent your sound has been and your songs have been right from the earliest days when you were writing for the Jukes uh, and the sound with the horns and the R and B flavor, and how that's been extended into Disciples of Soul, but contemporized, so, you know, with a, a brand new energy uh, and a brand new sensibility. Yet, you know, your roots are as obvious and as strong as, as they've ever been. And you refer to Lieber and Stoller, of course. Who else do you re think are main inspirations for you that help, if you will, define the sound of the Jukes and the Disciples of Soul in particular. Yeah, I mean, my, you know, my, 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 my life, as I, you know, I talk about this in the book because it, it is interesting how my life really began with the British invasion. I mean, 100% uh, the British invasion, you know. I, I wasn't interested before that and I wasn't interested in anything else for, for quite a while. But you're growing up, and, and and it was rock and soul, rock and soul, rock and soul. I mean, and, and it was, it, it, which is fascinating when you look back on it. I went back and looked at some of the old rock and roll TV shows, you know, Shindigs, the Hullabaloo's, or, or or Ready Steady Go in England, or you know, and you know, and and every one of them was like the Kinks would come on, and then Marvin Gaye would come on, you know. Uh, the the Stones would come on and and, and Curtis Mayfield, you know, uh, and, and it was it was it was really quite interesting uh, uh, that everybody made a point to to have that integration going on subliminally, you know, for us teenagers. So we you know we grew up not even understanding the concept of racism, you know, uh, because of that. Uh, starting with Alan Freed playing black records for white kids, you know, back in the fifties, uh, but that continued really with the soul music being embraced by the British invasion, you know. I mean, you know, the Stones are doing, uh, covering Otis Redding six months after Otis's record is on, the, is on the charts, you know. I mean, uh, you know, uh, you know it, wasn't, it wasn't like a long, long distance in between uh, either. But, but, you know, at some point, um, you know, around the Jukes, obviously, 74 or so, um, you know, you've kind of gone through all your different phases of the 60s. Um, and, you know, you're kind of searching for an identity that's your own. And we kind of just stumbled into that rock meets soul thing yeah. in one band, you know, that that we had been witnessing separately, you know. We just kind of combined it with the horn, the, you know, soul horns and uh, you know, danceable rhythms. Uh, and, and rock and roll guitar, you know. So, um, we, you know, suddenly it was like, okay, that's, you know, uh, we, you know we've, we still felt we had to have an identity back then. You know, it was, it was it's, it's not so obvious now, but back then, you know, growing up in the Renaissance of the 60s, everybody had a very distinct identity. So we we're conscious of that. And, and then um, then I continued it with my first solo album, and then I went off into a different artistic adventure. But um, when I decided to come back in 2017, 16, I said, you know, I'm gonna come back with my most unique, the, the identity that's most uniquely me, you know, which is that, that rock and soul, juke thing, right. men without women thing, you know, uh, and I'm gonna see where it can go, you know? And, and um, the, the, big, the big thrill for me of Summer of Sorcery was that's the only time in my life I've ever done two albums in a row with the same band and the same sound and, and you know the same genre, you know, first time. 
you know? And I always wondered, like, where, where I wonder where would I, where I would have evolved to if I'd stayed in one, you know, but all, all five of my solo albums in the 80s were soundtracks to the theme of, of that album, you know? So they were completely different genres, different bands, you know, uh, just really different soundtracks to different movies, yeah. you know, basically, which, you know, not a good idea, kids. Don't try this at home, by the way. You know, not not a good career move. Okay, <laughs> but so so this is the first time I actually got a chance to you know do two two records in a row with the same band. And uh, anyway, um, so, how do you uh, how do you make how do you make sure to the best of your ability and in the best of life to make sure that this sound, which is great, it's classic. Uh, it is so much of what you are and have been all these years. How do you make sure it gets the opportunity to, if you will, transcend into the millennial generation? How do you, how do you make sure that uh, it, it, they might not embrace it the way you have, I have, but they at least need to be exposed to it? Where, where uh, did, know, how did that happen? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, that's kind of like, you know, I, I can do a lot of things, but that's kind of not my job, you know? Um, you know, you gotta hope the record company, you know, does something or, the, or your managers or, you know, um, I, I really, uh, I don't control that. You know, I can only do what I can control, you know? So I can control the art part, you know, the craft part, but um, when it comes to, you know, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll do interviews all day long, whoever wants to talk, you know, um, and I do. So, you know, you try and, and try and break through to a younger generation, but, um, you know, um, if, I was, if I was starting now and I, was, and I was into this kind of music now, you know, probably, in, you know, an album or two, I would try and have a younger artist maybe join me on the album. You know, to connect to their audience, you know, in a way, if they were fans, you know, um, I actually tried to get to Bruno Mars for this, for this, for Summer Sorcery, think with that in mind, you know, because yeah, yeah. I really, I really, I really like him. And uh, I thought he would relate to this album, you know, I thought he would like it. And you know, so if he, had done a, you know, if he had done a duet, you know, might have opened, opened it up to a whole new audience. Um because I really, I never really answered your question before, which was, which was, where does this stuff come from? This, so, 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 uh, around the Jukes, turn, you know, I, I took a turn for towards soul music, and and that and that Motown, Motown has to be uh, the number one influence, you know, on, on what I do. I mean, you, you have a few other, you know, I got a little bit of, um, uh, you know, a little bit of the Curtis Mayfield Chicago thing. I got a little bit of Alan Toussaint's New Orleans thing. Um, and certainly some of the Atlantic, you know, in Memphis, uh, you know, Sam and Dave Otis Redding, you know, uh, down to fame and Muscle Shoals, you know, that whole thing uh, um, is, is going on and some Atlantic stuff as well. But Motown, I have to say, is a center of uh, my soul influence, I think, you know. Well, uh, I, I always big, thought... I, I always put Memphis horns. What about the Memphis horns? With well, that, uh, well, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't say. I mean, because you're gonna you, certainly that's true. Um, but once I got into strings, you see, when, once you get into, you know, once you get into strings, now now you know, you're going put towards Motown a little bit, you know. Uh, but you know, you're right. No, Memphis horns are extremely important. I mean, that that the Jukes were more Memphis horns probably. Yeah than yeah. anything yeah you're right um but but you know now i think when this last this last two albums i think i think you can hear more of the uh more, more of the motown thing happening because you know i got strings on a lot of things and uh and they're you know i, I wish they, they i wish they publicized their arrangers you know they, they, their arrangers should have credit on every record they're so so amazing their arrangers and, and been so influential to me um the arrangers you know never get respect it's, it's amazing and, you know and up until i don't know up until the 70s or mid 70s every single session had an arranger you know uh extremely important part of the record and uh you know unless you were lucky enough to have a you know george martin as your producer who also an arranger but um you know anyway uh, uh yeah motown's kind of yeah took over and and um Plus, I added the girls. You know, I fell in love with the background vocals doing Darlene Love's album um, just a few years ago. You know, introducing Darlene Love, and she had those great background vocals. So, for the first time, I'm arranging background vocals as well as strings and horns, 
And that jigsaw puzzle was just so much fun. I mean, that's my idea of a day at the beach, you know, that that's just nothing but fun. And um, I really fell in love, you know, and that's the one thing I never had in my, in my music really, or the jukes really, was, was the harmony, a presence of, of, of harmony, you know? And so that was the whole new world of fun. And, and, uh, and once I kept like, you know, so when I came back, uh, I added that the three girls as an additional element in the music. And, um, and that really kind of put it into the Motown. You know, now you got background vocals and strings and horns, you know, uh, now you're really in the Mo in Motown's uh, uh, world, you know? So as you, you know, you look back now, I mean, you've been in this business a very, very long time uh, and your contributions are uh, extremely significant. You've written a book, you have the album, you go on tour, mo hopefully, most likely with Bruce the next year or so. Um, what's there left for you to do? I mean, what, where, how, do you, how do you continue that commitment to the music that you love and you've embraced and that you carry on? What, what's left? Well, there's lot, there's lots of lots of possibilities. Um, you know, my life uh, tends to be um, nothing that I plan, <laughs> almost nothing. You know, I mean, I can I can give you a whole bunch of great plans right now. I guarantee you that none of them will happen. Uh, you know, my life always comes through the back door. You know, I'm I'm over here like you know, banging my head against the the, the front door and it comes in the back door. Um, I would like, I, I, my favorite thing to do is, is to produce live events, which I never do. <laughs> I mean, uh, my, the, the epitome, you know, the, the height of my artistic uh, life really was, was the Broadway show, you know, Once Upon a Dream, the, the, the rascal show that I, I wrote and directed and, and produced, you know, with, with Mark Brickman and my wife, Maureen. Uh, that, that to me was the ultimate, you know, um, where you can you you can do you can use everything you, musically you, you want to, but it's also the you know, choreography. It's it's a, it's the production. It, it's you know, um, I mean, if I had another life, you know, I'd like to come back as Diaghilev. You know, what I mean, I, I want to come back as you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, that 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 kind of uh, you know that that, that kind of. The live, the live. There's nothing quite like the live thing for me. So I, you know, I'd like to do more of that if I could find my way to to, to do it. I don't know at this point, um, but it's also, um, you know, the, the 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 one thing about summer sorcery that was really unique for me was the first record I've ever done. It was not autobiographical and not political. Uh, so it, it was really liberating. And I realized, wow, I could make records like this all day long. <laughs> you know, you mean I can write about anything? <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, I don't, you know, it's not, it doesn't have to be about life and death. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's quite, it was quite a, wow, this is fun. So I just became 10 different people and 10 different songs, whatever it was, 12, you know, and uh, different characters and different songs and, uh, and telling different stories. So, you know, there's really no end to that. I don't know, you know, I don't know if, you know, if I could find, I mean, Bruce Tresnikoff and, and, and everybody at Universal has been amazing, uh, really supporting everything we've done so far. Even though, you know, hasn't said no yet, but, but uh, you know, we'll see if you want, if you want to do another record or not. I'm not sure I have time to do another record or not, but if I, if I do, hopefully he'll want to do it. Um, well, but, uh, you know. We'll, we'll I, see. So, you know, it could, it could be a record. It could be, could be a new TV show. I mean, I really, I love TV and I got five scripts. I got, I got five hit shows in my pocket. Okay. So any one of them could go and, and I could, you know, I could spend, you know, you could spend five years doing a TV show, you know? Sure. sure. So, when you say you have scripts, scripts that you've written. Yeah. Oh yeah. That I've written. Yeah. And, and occasionally you get offers for other things too. Yeah. You know, and you never know. Some, some, uh, you know, one of those offers may be terrific, a terrific, a terrific new show or a movie. You know, um, you know, and uh, you know, occasionally you might want to do a cameo like I did with Marty. You know, with the Irishman, uh, which was just you know, a great fulfilling of a, a dream to work with Marty after all these years. You know, I've known him a long time. And uh, finally, get a chance to work with him, even if it was just two days. <laughs> but it was, 
you know, I'm on screen for about six seconds, but uh, it was still great. You know, it was sure, still yeah. it was really, really great. So you know, well, just, things come up, you know, like that. But I don't, I don't have any right now. Tell you the truth, I don't have any burning, you know, uh, you know, need to do something creative right this minute that I want to jump into. But it'll come, you know, it'll come. Those things, you know, they don't, you know, that, that stuff doesn't leave you alone too long. You know, all of a sudden it's like, wow, that's a, that's an idea. Let's do that. Or somebody will come to me for a movie song or something, you know, we'll see. Well, um, there's always on the horizon uh, an E Street Band tour. You, you'd you have to be excited about that. I mean, that gets you back out in the live experience and, and reaching out to fans that haven't been really met with for a number of years now. Yeah, yeah, it has been a few a few years longer than we than we expected. I, I think yeah. in between, you know, um, because of the pandemic, um, I, you know, I, I cut my I cut my tour short so that we'd have time to to do the new E Street Band album. And um, you know, I thought, yeah, we spent a couple months doing it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, we, we ended like November sixth or November 9th of what of nineteen, I, I guess, yeah. right, and. Uh, thinking we'll spend a couple of months making a record and be out on the road for summer of 2020, you know? Yeah. But then, you know, first of all, we do the record in four days, <laughs> which was, you know, uh, you know, in the past, you know, the records have gone on and on and on. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, the, you know, in the early days, they weren't, weren't so much fun. This one was like, come on, let's, you know, let's do some more. <laughs> like what, what, that's all you got, you know? <laughs> Uh, I mean, for the first time, I think since I've known him, Bruce really made made the record the way I make records, which is a concept, you know, that he really, he knew exactly what he was doing beforehand, you know, that's how I, you know, I, I do all my records that way. I, I, I outline them, I have the themes, I have titles, I know what they're going to, I know what they're going to be before I write them, you know, uh, but Bruce usually finds a record, you know, kind of in the middle or after he's recording for a while. So you know, I thought we'd do a couple months, you know, have some fun, you know, because you know, you know, you haven't seen the really the East Street guys that often, you know. Uh, I'll talk to Max now and then or Gary, but um, you know, never never see Roy and uh, you know or Charlie or you know, so so you know, looking forward to it. And then uh, so he booked, he booked like five days, and I thought, well, he just wants to try out some things, you know. Yeah, then we'll start the record. <laughs> Fifth day, we had nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> we, we sat around drinking tequila and listening to what we had done. I'm like, you know, geez, you know, we're getting too good at this. A little too good. Well, but anyway, yeah, anyway so, so yeah, so, so we'll see. I mean, we'll see what Bruce wants to do. Uh, Maniac is going back to Broadway. I, I can't believe this guy. He's too much. He makes me look lazy, huh? <laughs> Well, look, um, congratulations on the album. We look forward to also reading the book as well. And we're going to try and touch base with you when the book comes out. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in September at some point. And, uh, and let's, hope, let's hope that there is a, a, an E Street Band tour next year, year after, whenever, hopefully next year. And that most importantly, you continue with your, your passion for the music and your passion to do things. Uh, it's always inspiring to talk to you and it's always inspiring to hear the music because if there's one thing that comes through your music, Stevie, if there's one thing, it's absolute passion for it. And uh, I'm not just saying that. I know every one of your fans would say the exact same thing. So I've been listening to you since 1974 and you never once failed me in that regard. So. Personally, thank you for that, and let's hope it continues. Thank you, my friend. Always good talking to you. You bet. Okay. All right, man. That was Bye -bye. Awesome.